James 2. Remember, we've been in this, uh, starting with James 2, 14 through 26. Uh, James is talking about uh, contrasting a living faith to a dead faith. And he used four examples. Uh, the first example was 14 through 17 of a believer who uh, showed dead faith. And then 18 through 20, he showed demons, dead faith. And then 21 through 24, he used Abraham as an example of living faith. And then 25, 26 tonight, he uses Rahab as an example of living faith. And uh, so <clears throat> here we are in 25, 26. Now, pay attention to a couple key phrases because sometimes when we read through these things and don't pay attention to context. Remember, context is really important. Now, the context for, for James uh, 2, 25, 26 starts at 14, right? Context. Now, my text is 25, 26. But here's what's important. Watch these two little phrases. In the same way. That's really important. Because who has he just made an example of? Abraham. Abraham, the father of the patriarchs. Right? In the same way, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot? In the same way, in the same venue, as the stained glass guy called Abraham, right? In the same way was not a, a, a Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received this, that, that, that word received is really important. When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way, the word received and sent are really important. They're both heirs participles and they are connected by and, which is an adjunctive chi, adjunctive chi, not conjunctive. While it is a conjunction, it's called adjunction, meaning he's connecting to something. And what he's doing, he's, con he's connecting two heirs participles, the word received and the word sent. And these are really important for how she made biblical history. She made biblical history because of that. <laughs> and then he gives, um, he, he gives a, a summary idea of verses 14 through 26 when he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, notice that's not the capital S spirit, that's a human. For just as the body without the human spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. He's talking about a living faith versus a dead faith. Okay? So what we're going to look at tonight is Rahab, Rahab's living faith. And she's a pretty amazing woman. And no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what she's a classic example of. God's amazing grace. Because what James, and this caught James' attention. James had a lot of people in the Old Testament he could compare to Abraham. You know who he picked? Rehab the harlot. The Gentile street walker out of Jericho. Think about that. Fran, there's your message for your group. Yes. Was it my group too? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean James really reached in and pulled a, pulled, pulled he, he's listen and likewise right, he compares he puts her in a category with Abraham the stained glass guy the stained glass guy Rahab in the stained glass. Oh, I see you got it. I see you have a stained glass of Abraham the patriarch. How come you don't have one of Rahab the harlot? <laughs> 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 
Say, I love this kind of stuff. Say, I got a book in my head on that deal. So, see, so see he, I said, guys, I, unfortunately, I know more about Rahab than I do about Abraham. How about that? <laughs> to write about. So here we are in James 2, 25 and 26. What I found to be really interesting was that James, James put the harlot and faith together with a believer named Rahab. And he tagged her with what she did in life before salvation that defined who she was to the world. It's how the worlds are. I found that really interesting because she picked, James picked her out and said, here's a classic example. If you think Abraham was my man, give me an A, give me a B, give me an R. If, hell yeah, well how about Give me an R, give me an A, give me an H, give me a B. Yeah. How about that? Of all the women in the Bible, he picked her because, listen, she reflect the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. We're going to get after this thing. You're indwelt as a believer because you, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit because you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried on third day, raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. Because you live in the new covenant, at that moment, he indwelt your body with the Holy Spirit that changed your body from a fleshly vessel into the temple of God in time. For eternity. The Holy Spirit is what gives you the power to be spiritual in all of the adversities of life. The problem is that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it nor live it, learn or live it in the flesh or carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins, sins of the tongue whatever or more, whatever, you've quenched the Holy Spirit by not confessing. So confess it and get back with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in the teaching hours so that he can transfer information as truth because it is truth that sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. John eight forty four. I give you a moment. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How thankful we are for that, Father, the work of Christ on the cross extended to the Christian life in dealing with personal sin, not Adamic sin as in salvation, but personal sin as in the ministry of the Holy Spirit because we've become flesh or carnal and we confess and we're back spiritual. And it should be a learning process about the way sin is working in our life. Because if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, which results, according to James 1, 13 and 14, sin. And so, thank you for your amazing grace extended to the Christian life. It is always the blood, isn't it, Father? The sacrificial death of Christ on that cross extended to my life to bring me into the spiritual power system on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. When James compares the harlot, the harlot with God's, with God's, with God's faith, the only way that can ever be produced in a person to change the character of their existence on earth, like in Rahab the harlot. The only way that can happen is the grace gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It is the grace gospel of Jesus Christ that's put saving faith with harlotry and then refers to this person as absolute righteous. Now think about that. Nothing she did. And it wasn't, listen, is it wasn't what she did in her life before she was, she was saved that made her a sinner. She was a sinner because of Adam's sin. Abraham was a sinner because of, Ab because of Adam's sin. All of us are sinners because, it's not because of what we do, but because who we are in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, in Adam you all die. Romans 5, 12 says, and that death is a result of Adam's sin. She's not a sinner. Now the Jews thought that. She's not a sinner because she's a harlot. She's a sinner. She would, she's no more a sinner as a harlot than the doctor is a lawyer, a doctor is a doctor or a lawyer a lawyer. You understand? All of these were professions. Didn't make one righteous and one a sinner. Made them all sinners because of Adam's sin. They all need the gospel of Jesus Christ to change their life. And I found that really interesting how James picked these people out to, well, how he contrasted living faith. He took one of the big guys called Abraham in the Jewish faith and then picked a, a lady out called Rahab the harlot and, 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 and put them together. Put them side by side. And said, here stand two justified people through the grace of God, through the work of Christ on the cross. Two, two justified people, both with the same inheritance in God through Christ. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? To tell me that's not a good message, Horton, to take to the world. When you as a student probably coming up, at least most of you that are near my age, remember the Scarlet Letter? Remember reading the, the book on the Scarlet Letter? Gosh, yeah. I mean, it's one of those classic things we all read. And that was, okay. The Bible had an answer for that book. The Bible had an answer for that book. 2 Corinthians 5.21 was those. He says, He made, God made him Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Who is the we? We are all, all of us in Adam. We are, we are made righteous in Christ. <laughs> she can stand next to Abraham in eternity because an, an equality of her born again nature. She can stand in equality with Abraham. As far as salvation, they are both absolutely righteous because of the wonderful grace of God, that amazing grace that saves everybody the same way. No matter whether you're black or white, doesn't matter whether or not you're a woman or not a woman or a woman or a man, I guess. A woman or not a woman. But you know what I mean. <laughs> this lesson will study five aspects of Rahab's living faith recorded in real time. The real time of her life is Joshua 2, 1 through 24. I would, I would ask you to circle the second chapter, 9 through 14, and read that personally. And uh, you can read more about, about her in uh, the sixth chapter, 22 through 25. A and listen. She made Hebrews 11. She's recorded in verse 31. Now here's my first point. Rahab needs for salvation. Her need for salvation. Rahab's need for salvation is not because she's a harlot. But because she's a sinner. You know it's interesting. If you study the Bible. And I'm sure Matthew got this point. The reason he picked. Uh, Matthew and James. Matthew uses it in the most wonderful way, and so does James. So does the writer of Hebrews. It's because Jesus, listen, these women are attracted to Jesus. You know why? Unconditional love. There's the one man they ever met 
the woman at the well was surprised about that, wasn't she? This was not like any man she'd ever met. Everybody that was nice as he was always was putting a hit on her. Every time she met a guy as nice as Jesus, that guy always had an ulterior motive. She let him know right away, didn't she? Don't blow none of that smoke in my face. I'm tired of men right now. I've been through my fifth. Anybody, anytime anybody goes through the fifth, he's probably tired. She's a sinner because of Adam's sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and Romans 5, 12. Paul says it. Paul says this about himself. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says, it is a trustworthy statement. In other words, it is a statement that everyone should hear because it's the good news of amazing grace. Deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The righteous don't have a need for him. It's the unrighteous that have a need for him. Among whom I'm foremost of all. I love the King James who says I'm the chief. <laughs> Every time I hear that, Sylvia always referred to me as the chief. I said, I don't know quite how to take that, Sylvia. She said, will you take it out of 1 Timothy 1.15, Ron Edema? And so I did. In justification, and in justification by saving faith, the working object is the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 explains to you the gospel that he died on the cross for sin. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Romans 1, 16 tells you the mechanics. That gospel just explained is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Who believes, not who works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he's saved by grace through faith and not of himself is a gift, not of works. You put all those passages together, you got an amazing grace. You can go to church and sing amazing grace. It used to be in the hymn book. It was on page 188. Anyhow, some, some songs you never forget. When I was at, if I got to church early, and I'm talking about a pew, I'm not talking about a pastor, I'm talking about a pew warmer. I always, I always picked that book up called The Hymn. I always loved the fact that it was a hymn book. I always spelled it different. I spelled it H-I-M. And I'd turn to 188, and I'd read that. And I thought, oh, God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> Saved a wretch like me. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that song ought to, ought to melt your heart, boy. Amazing grace. That old boy. Newton got a hold of a song, didn't he? <laughs> Way back in the 1718, 1700 and 1800, this guy got a hold of it. You know why? Because guy got a hold of him, didn't he? He just beat all of us to the song. <laughs> he just beat all of us to the song. Listen to this, Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified, heir is passive participle. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way you can get it. Can't get peace with God any other way. Romans 5, 1 and 2. You can't get it any place else. And why do we need it? Because you're alienated. Because you're alienated and estranged from God because of Adam's sin. Part of the 13 judicial charges. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have obtained. I mean if that's not enough. Let me add this on and then sing amazing grace. Th through whom also we have obtained our inheritance by faith. Look at the faith used twice in that passage. So that you could sing amazing grace every day. You couldn't, have, you couldn't possibly have a bad day. And if you are, sing Amazing Grace because you, 
you, you, you've got your head in the wrong place. Lift it up. Put your chin up. Lift your eyes towards your Redeemer, for He always lives with you. Kind of, kind of an attitude, a bad day. Even, even if it rained 150 days, He'd give you a boat. Right? I'm getting to wonder about that too. Listen to the salvation formula. You ought to always remember this. Here, is it, here it is, the formula for an unbeliever. Faith. An unbeliever can come to faith and put that faith in the working object, which is the gospel, which I just explained, and that will equal grace, salvation, justification. It's not faith. I mean, demons have that. Faith in what? <laughs> that working object. Faith has to have a working object. It always the word of God. It depends on what category we're in need of. If it's an unbeliever, then his need is salvation. How does he get it? You got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And what do I get? I get the divine production of that formula. I get grace salvation. I get 50 things that I could never lose in time and eternity. For sure. And that's just a drop in the bucket. You and I both know, I've told you a hundred times, there's more than 50 things. I just quit at 50. I thought 50 was enough to overwhelm me. It probably would be everybody who studied it. Number two, point two. Listen to me now, this is important. There are two sides to justification by saving faith. There's two sides to it. A subtraction side and an addition side. And this is really important you get this because this is the power of amazing grace. There are two sides. When you study the 50 things, you keep that in mind. Because you're going to get 50 things. Listen to me, you're going to get 50 things. 13 are subtracted from it. Never, never to be brought back. Subtraction side is the removal of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin once and forever. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans the fifth chapter in verse 1 and 2 and down into 12 and beyond. In fact, that's what Paul is talking about from in Romans from chapter 1 through 5. I mean, that's his whole subject matter. The addition side is the eight works of the Holy Spirit nine communion factors of the blood of Christ and the 50 status privileges of the royal family of God in that package of 50 things. And listen, you know why you should sing Amazing Grace? I mean, you ought to shout it from the housetop because of those 13 things that were removed that can never, removed in time and eternity. I tell you. Now here's the third thing. Rahab was one of five women listed in Matthew's genealogy of the Messianic Savior called Jesus Christ. Every Christmas, you know, you go to the book of Matthew and you go to the book of Luke and if you've been in the ministry as long as I have, you just wear those books out. Chapter 1 and 2 of Matthew. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Luke. I would like to teach from Matthew every year of my life because Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ that is so unbelievable. <laughs> and he, he breaks it down in verse 17. 14 generations from here to there and 14 from here to here and from 14 from here to here. He just breaks it down and just the most simplest terms of, of being able to follow along historically over a long period of time. He, he goes from Abraham to, the, to Jesus Christ historically. But the way he does it, oh, jeez, his light's out. And uh, 
I was going to do the genealogy this year, and I just went, uh, there are a lot of people just, they just the, so much history just bogs them down. You know, that's, 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 that's wonderful, Ron, but, you know, I've got cancer or I'm going through divorce. Or, you know, I do understand that, too. People need their life fixed, and they don't think they can get it done that way with history, but the history of that way he broke that down to cover that period is amazing. It's just amazing. Well, anyhow, for me... I say to myself when I read, and he puts five women in this genealogy, nobody else ever did that. You'll never find any Jewish historian do that. I mean, they're never going to do that. Matthew did it. And he put some of the most interesting ladies in it. Rahab the harlot. Then others, the five ladies, the five ladies themselves are. So for me, what's this show? Okay, Matthew, what, what are you doing? For me, knowing who his audience is, the book of Matthew, Jewish believers who are really struggling in the dispensational change the, trans, the transitional phase out of the Old Covenant and New Covenant from the Jewish age to the church age, all of that difficulty stuff. Matthew showed, show, it, this is my take. Matthew showed, at least to me, Matthew showed to a Judy, Judeus, Jewish audience that a Gentile woman considered among the top of sinners if you know anything about how the Jews, how Jesus dealt with the Jews, was listed among Abraham's list of top justified believers in the genealogy of Christ. I mean, we're in the genealogy at Matthew 1.5 when we meet her. He puts her early in. Rahab, at least for me, Rahab was a testimony to what God is free to do for the worst of sinners by the gospel of grace salvation. All these women in that genealogy tell you that. And therefore, it, it endear, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 9 in, endears me to this. We're saved by grace through faith and not ourselves as a gift. She, she was a testimony to justification by saving faith under the old covenant. Just like everyone else listed with Abraham in, his, in Matthew's genealogy. Just like everybody else. Huh? You look at these five women. Saved just like everybody else. All the big boys. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, just like the big boys. See, I love that. I love that. Rahab the harlot, street, walk, street walker in Jericho with the big boys. Justification by saving faith. James put Rahab the harlot in verse 25 and 26 of James 2 in the same righteous category as Abraham the patriarch when he said, in the same way was not Abraham the high also justified. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> By her works. Oh, oh wait a minute. <laughs> By, <laughs> By her works. Oh. I'll tell you what it was. It was their testimony to justification by saving faith just like everyone else. It wasn't what she was before she got saved. It's what she became because she got saved. 
instead of a child of the, of the night, became a child of the light. Instead of standing on the street corner trying to make a little money, she was preaching the gospel. What happened to Rahab? Same thing happened to me and you. She got born again. She got saved. She got what Jesus tried to get Nicodemus to understand in John the third chapter. I salute Rahab today, don't I? Because she's the trophy of God's grace. Point number four. Note the writer of Hebrew does something interesting in Hebrews 11.31. Here's what he does. He calls the Israelite spies what they actually were, spies. They were reconnaissance. They were reconnaissance spies. He calls them spies. Joshua. That's not what James called them. <laughs> Stop what James called them. Don't you miss what he called them. Because there lies the great story. James didn't call them that. Watch this now. James called them messengers. Put a definite article with it. And it's the word you get angel from or messenger. And listen, the idea behind it is a divine messenger. Gabriel shows up in the birth story, right? When you find an angel show up for God, it, it's a big deal. He's brought you a big time message, right? James did not call them spies. He called them messengers. Messengers. What message did they bring to Rahab that changed her life? Was her life changed? Yes. <laughs> she got in the books, baby. She's in the big books with the big top guys. What was the message they brought? The message that changed her life, the same message that you got that changed yours. They brought, they brought her the prophetic gospel, and she believed it. The next thing of interest in our lesson text is the connection. See, she got saved. And watch this. He covers the, these, this episode in the most marvelous way by connecting two heirs participles in James 2.25. The first participle was she received. Ekbalo. Uh, uh, excuse me. Hupodekomai. She received. Heiress middle participle. The messengers. Here's what, the, here's what James is saying. She received the message of the spies as important to her salvation in James 2, 9 through 14. That's well worth your time one day to go back and look at that. Because listen, she was ready for the message they were able to give to her because that message had gone ahead of them. Who are these people walking around? What are they doing out there? What, what's the deal? There's, a, there's three or four million people standing outside our gate. They sent their reconnaissance out. And there was a big buzz about who these people were. And it's amazing. And they give, they get, they, she's got the questions and they give her the answers. And she believes them. The second part is simple. Says, and she sent them. Ekbalo, aorist active participle, and sent them out another way. She became their protector. She became one of them. She, she became a believer. As a believer, she acted upon the faith in the word of God that she had in her possession at that, at that, that time, which you can read in Joshua 2. Faith in the word of God is important to her rescue from invasion. And listen, not only did she was not only was she concerned about hers, but her entire family. Right? You know what, you know what kind of a change that was in her life? And listen, do you not understand that she picked the rest of her family up and put them in the boat like Noah did? 
That's what the amazing grace does in a person's life when it's changed. His, his life becomes inclusive, not exclusive to the people that is closest that he loves the most, right? Should be. Boy, it wasn't my life. I just need a little seasoning to be able to know how to do it without a aggravating everybody. Because that's all I want to talk about. And they can only stand a small diet of that. And I didn't know that. You have to spread it out a while sometimes. She includes everybody. Listen, not, not just me. I want everybody. You think different after you're saved than you do before. It's all about me. Before, before it's all about me. Listen, one of the signs of, of, of new birth should be it's not always all about you. All about you. When it's all about you, that's carnality. It's evidence. That's a sign of carnality. It's all about me. It's all about, and you know how you can hear it? Listen, if you got ears to hear, and I don't know if you do, but if you do, you'll hear the people that love you the most, the closest to you, keep telling you that. They'll tell it to you all day long. Just whether or not you, you got ears to hear it. M maybe God is sending you messages by messengers. I know he has been in my life. And so we have verse 25. In the same way was not Har uh, Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received and sent them out. See that? Received them, got saved, sent them out as a believer and she was justified by her works, not for her salvation, but because she was saved. She got justified by, listen, you don't get justified by works and salvation. You get justified by faith. And then when faith is rooted and grounded in a different working object of the word of God, not salvation, but spiritual life, categorical Bible doctrine, then it operates. But it operates the same way, divine production. And her justification in sending them out and including her family on the invasion. It's just like in your life. Except maybe in your life it took you 10 years to get there. But because you, you weren't under attack. <laughs> yeah. God speeded this whole deal up in her life. He knows which ones to speed up. I was a guy he had to speed up. Where are you going to take me? Take me quick, Father. Get me to the station number two because anyhow. So you see you have a first formula. So the saving formula I gave you. Now you have a word of God. But with salvation, it's narrowed down to the gospel. But with the Christian life, justification, the work part of it, comes down to the categorical doctrine that God is dealing with you on. And when you put it through the, the faith cycle, right, it's got to complete it. Or otherwise, it's, a dead, it's dead. When it completes that faith cycle, then you have what you have in this story. You have it completed. And then you have justification by works. You, you have justification by works. It's, it's made the faith cycle where it comes back to what God promised you. He has fulfilled. He's performed. They're both exciting to me. I love both sides of the faith cycle. I love studying the word of God. I love when he breaks through on you and, and, and you go like, whoa, God. oh, wow. Is that what that means? Oh, wow. I mean, that just revs my engine. And then the backside, when God brings it to pass and, and you can write it in your book, when it becomes a testimonial of your life, you can't wait to share other people with how God intervened and how God just, how God is faithful, right? They're both, and I go, whoa! They're both exciting to me. When I get it, I, I'm excited. When I get the word, I break through on that thing. I get excited in my faith. And then when I see God just step in and do what he promised, it just, it just lights out for me. It lights my whole world up. I can live off from that stuff for a day or two, and then I get, I get addictive again for a little more of that. I love that. And so you have the formula of faith plus a working object equals divine production, but in the Christian life, 
it works a little different because it's, it depends on the categorical word of God that he has you under. And it produces justification in the Christian way of life. That's justification by works. I, I, I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the great things I learned in my own, when I learned the faith cycle and was able to put all this information together that I acquired over the years, setting under great pastors, and I was able to break that down and make that into a simple understanding, it broke my world wide open. I get excited on the hearing and believing side. I get excited on the application completing side. It just brought a whole new light into my world of, of, of wisdom. And uh, it, 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 it broke it down simply. I'm a guy who just has to have broke down simply in my life. Now, here's my fifth point. Like, like all saved by grace, Rahab was a trophy of God's amazing grace. Not because she would be maybe the worst of sinners like Paul said. No, listen, that's not true. That's, that's not what made her. Listen, what made her a trophy of God's amazing grace was that she got saved. That's what makes us all the trophy of God's. It's not, it's not what we, how we were before we got saved. And it's not what we did after. We're a trophy of God's amazing grace because we had the good sense to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we got saved by grace through faith and not of ourself. The trophy is about the praise of God. It is about God's grace that we are so happy with. We become his trophy. Not by, not by what we do. It's who we've become in him. Like all say turn out in Christ. Now, you, you know, you go back to your class reunion. Some people, they're, they, they, when you, people would say, well, what, what did you, what did you, what did you become? That, that's basically what they're asking you. And, he says, well, I'm, I've become a scientist and I, I was part of putting the, I was part of putting men on the moon. And everybody goes, I would have known that you were a nerd. Oh, no, I'm, excuse me. You were a great science student <laughs> when we were in school. And they go around the room and everybody's that way. Oh, yeah, sure. What well, how about you? Well, I'm a bum. I, yeah, I, I know that too. Uh, uh but I'll tell you, when you when when the Christian, when a Christian gets an opportunity like that, listen, what did they say? They're the most unusual people. Unless they were already saved. I didn't know anybody like that. <laughs> if they were already saved, there's probably people saved. I just didn't know them. I didn't run with, I didn't run with that group. If they were saved, they're probably their life, you know. When we got to people like me, everybody went. <coughs> what they don't realize is that my identity in life is not who I was before I met Christ. Because I was a sinner. It wouldn't have mattered if I was the good kid in class or the bad kid in class. It didn't matter because I was a sinner. We become a trophy of God's grace, not because we pass from good to better, but we pass from sinner to saved. But I can tell you, at some point in your life, you've got to realize that what God did, for, what God has done with your life in Christ is much more amazing than you ever did with your life alone. Now, for some of us like me, my whole life was changed with Christ. My whole life. Everything about me. All my ambitions, all my aspirations. I mean, it is totally, completely changed.
And so when I read a story like Rahab, I can really relate to her. Because her life was so dramatically changed that day when she got rescued by those what? Two messengers. I love Matthew's. Matthew called them messengers of God. These two messengers of God. Rahab married one of those two messengers. She married Salom or Salmon. Whatever you like to eat. One of the two spies. Salmon was 10th from Abraham, if you pay attention to that. In marriage, Rahab became fourth from King David. Think about that for a moment. Now, she's not there because she married somebody. She got there because she got saved and married somebody. This means, watch this now, I love Matthew. Matthew, boy, he is getting them. <laughs> I'll tell you, when this sermon gets over, the Jews are going to take, ask him to take a walk with them. Rahab the harlot, the streetwalker from Jericho married into messianic royalty of biblical history. Whoa! -ah. Who could have wrote that story? Who could write that story, man? Oh my God! <laughs> In the same way, also, I love that. In the same way, also. Thank you, Matthew. Nobody would have had the courage to do what you did. May we have the courage to be faithful to what God calls us to do in our life. May we be faithful. Even if everybody else says, that's stupid, I wouldn't write that. If God tells you to do it, you do it. There's nothing stupid with God's word. It touches your life. And so I wrote two of the four stanzas of a hymn for all the Rahabs of the world. <laughs> if you're on the internet tonight and you're a Rahab, I want you to listen to what God's offering you tonight. From a messenger called John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Christ tonight offers you and welcomes you will make a trophy of your life by grace. If you will believe that his son came to die for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, if you will believe that tonight, you too can become not who you were in the past, but what God offers you as a new start. He will give you new birth. He will make you a trophy of his grace. And you too can have a part in the wonderful history of God's grace. He can do for you what you could never imagine to do for yourself, never in a million years. For all the Rahabs tonight, come to God through Christ. Rahab gives her testimony to you that God will welcome you with open arms. In Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for those who have heard this message, for those who would dare to believe it like Rahab, and to find her life not only rescued from the moment, but delivered into the most amazing life a person could ever imagine, and there's all of that for all of us. 
because we are trophies of God's amazing grace when we believe the gospel, for we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves as a gift. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for such a wonderful opportunity for a new start in life. And we offer it to all who will hear us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.